Chapter Eleven of Persuasion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Persuasion, by Jane Austen, Chapter Eleven. The time now approached for Lady Russell's return. The day was even fixed. And Anne, being engaged to join her as soon as she was resettled, was looking forward to an early removal to Kellynch, and beginning to think how her own comfort was likely to be affected by it. It would place her in the same village with Captain Wentworth, within half a mile of him. They would have to frequent the same church, and there must be intercourse between the two families. This was against her. But on the other hand, he spent so much of his time at Uppercross. That in removing thence she might be considered rather as leaving him behind than as going towards him, and upon the whole she believed she must, on this interesting question, be the gainer, almost as certainly as in her change of domestic society in leaving poor Mary for Lady Russell. She wished it might be possible for her to avoid ever seeing Captain Wentworth at the hall. Those rooms had witnessed former meetings which would be brought too painfully before her. But she was yet more anxious for the possibility of Lady Russell and Captain Wentworth never meeting anywhere. They did not like each other, and no renewal of acquaintance now could do any good. And were Lady Russell to see them together, she might think that he had too much self-possession and she too little. These points formed her chief solicitude in anticipating her removal from Uppercross, where she felt she had been stationed quite long enough. Her usefulness to little Charles would always give some sweetness to the memory of her two months' visit there, but he was gaining strength apace, and she had nothing else to stay for. The conclusion of her visit, however, was diversified in a way which she had not at all imagined. Captain Wentworth, after being unseen and unheard of at Uppercross for two whole days, appeared again among them to justify himself by a relation of what had kept him away. A letter from his friend, Captain Harville. Having found him out at last, had brought intelligence of Captain Harville's being settled with his family at Lyme for the winter, of their being therefore quite unknowingly within twenty miles of each other. Captain Harville had never been in good health since a severe wound which he received two years before, and Captain Wentworth's anxiety to see him had determined him to go immediately to Lyme. He had been there for four and twenty hours. His acquittal was complete. His friendship warmly honoured. Of lively interest excited for his friend, and his description of the fine country about Lyme so feelingly attended to by the party that an earnest desire to see Lyme themselves and a project for going thither was the consequence. The young people were all wild to see Lyme. Captain Wentworth talked of going there again himself. It was only seventeen miles from Uppercross, though November the weather was by no means bad, and in short, Louisa, who was the most eager of the eager. Having formed the resolution to go, and besides the pleasure of doing as she liked, being now armed with the idea of merit in maintaining her own way, bore down all the wishes of her father and mother for putting it off till summer, and to Lyme they were to go: Charles, Mary, Anne, Henrietta, Louisa, and Captain Wentworth. The first heedless scheme had been to go in the morning and return at night, but to this Mr. Musgrove, for the sake of his horses, would not consent. And when it came to be rationally considered, a day in the middle of November would not leave much time for seeing a new place, after deducting seven hours, as the nature of the country required, for going and returning. They were consequently to stay the night there, and not to be expected back till the next day's dinner. This was felt to be a rather considerable amendment, and though they all met at the great house at rather an early breakfast hour and set off very punctually. It was so much past noon before the two carriages, Mr. Musgrove's coach containing the four ladies and Charles's curricle, in which he drove Captain Wentworth, were descending the long hill into Lyme and entering upon the still steeper street of the town itself, that it was very evident they would not have more than time for looking about them before the light and warmth of the day were gone. After securing accommodations and ordering a dinner at one of the inns. The next thing to be done was unquestionably to walk directly down to the sea. They were come too late in the year for any amusement or variety which Lyme, as a public place, might offer. The rooms were shut up, the lodgers almost all gone, scarcely any family but of the residents left, and as there is nothing to admire in the buildings themselves, 
the remarkable situation of the town, the principal street almost hurrying into the water, the walk to the cob, skirting round the pleasant little bay, which, in the season, is animated with bathing machines and company, the cob itself, its old wonders and new improvements, with the very beautiful line of cliffs stretching out to the east of the town, are what the stranger's eye will seek, and a very strange stranger it must be, who does not see charms in the immediate environs of Lyme, to make him wish to know it better. The scenes in its neighbourhood, Charmouth, with its high grounds and extensive sweeps of country, and still more, its sweet retired bay, backed by dark cliffs, where fragments of low rock among the sands, make it the happiest spot for watching the flow of the tide, for sitting in unwearied contemplation, the woody varieties of the cheerful village of Uplime, and, above all, Pinny, with its green chasms between romantic rocks, where the scattered forest trees and orchards of luxuriant growth, declare that many a generation must have passed away since the first partial falling of the cliff prepared the ground for such a state, where a scene so wonderful and so lovely is exhibited, as may more than equal any of the resembling scenes of the far-famed Isle of Wight, these places must be visited, and visited again, to make the worth of Lyme understood. The party from Uppercross, passing down by the now deserted and melancholy-looking rooms, and still descending, soon found themselves on the seashore, and lingering only, as all must linger and gaze on a first return to the sea, who ever deserved to look on it at all, proceeded towards the cob, equally their object in itself, and on Captain Wentworth's account. For in a small house, near the foot of an old pier of unknown date, were where the Harvilles settled. Captain Wentworth turned in to call on his friend, the others walked on, and he was to join them on the cob. They were by no means tired of wondering and admiring, and not even Louisa seemed to feel that they had parted with Captain Wentworth long, when they saw him coming after them, with three companions, all well known already by description, to be Captain and Mrs. Harville, and to Captain Bennock, who was staying with them. Captain Bennock had some time ago been first lieutenant of the Laconia, and the account which Captain Wentworth had given of him, on his return from Lyme before, his warm praise of him as an excellent young man and an officer, whom he had always valued highly, which must have stamped him well in the esteem of every listener, had been followed by a little history of his private life, which rendered him perfectly interesting in the eyes of all the ladies. He had been engaged to Captain Harville's sister, and was now mourning her loss. They had been a year or two waiting for fortune and promotion. Fortune came— his prize-money as lieutenant being great. Promotion, too, came at last, but Fanny Harville did not live to know it. She had died the preceding summer while he was at sea. Captain Wentworth believed it impossible for man to be more attached to woman than poor Bennock had been to Fanny Harville, or to be more deeply afflicted under the dreadful change. He considered his disposition as of the sort which must suffer heavily, uniting very strong feelings with quiet, serious and retiring manners, and a decided taste for reading, and sedentary pursuits. To finish the interest of the story, the friendship between him and the Harvilles seemed, if possible, augmented by the event which closed all their views of alliance, and Captain Bennock was now living with them entirely. Captain Harville had taken his present house for half a year, his taste, and his health, and his fortune, all directing him to a residence inexpensive, and by the sea and the grandeur of the country, and the retirement of Lyme in the winter, appeared exactly adapted to Captain Bennock's state of mind. The sympathy and good-will excited towards Captain Bennock was very great. 